Okay. Uh, next up is Will Wegman from the Ministry of Natural Resources. Uh, Will is an extension services technician. He's out of the Aurora District office. Um, when he's not writing press releases or fact sheets about uh, fisheries and fisheries monitoring, um, he's out in the field uh, fishing, elector fishing with the TRCA. Um, he's working <laughs> on the Lake Simcoe Mus Muskie Restoration Program and coordinates seven urban fishing festivals, including two here in Toronto on behalf of the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources. In a professional capacity, he helped with the fishing in Toronto Islands brochure um, with the City of Toronto and fished with Bob Azumi. I think it's great that you can that you can do that on, on professional time. Uh, um, when, he's not, when he's not being paid to fish, he's also fishing. Uh, he's an accomplished tournament angler, an outdoor, writing, uh, sorry, an outdoor writer, a seminar host. Um, he was part of the Fishes of Toronto um, team that put together the book. Um, and he knows a lot about warm water fish and how to catch them, which is, you know, maybe if you have a tip, possibly. That would be great. Uh, welcome, Will. Actually, before I put my glass down, why don't we all raise a, a glass to uh, uh, Councillor Fletcher and thank her again for the wonderful work she's doing on behalf of anglers in this city. Woo! Cheers. Woo! She just made it much more of a relief for me to come up here tonight, so <laughs> I feel really good about that. All right, thank you very much, everyone. You know, this is a, a great setting for me. It's a, it's a little bit different. I had to uh, sort of go out of my comfort zone into uh, uh, the city, I guess, and perhaps in a, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but I'm, uh, I'm really glad I'm here this evening, and I think we have uh, reason to celebrate. It makes my job so much easier when, uh, when we can actively promote fishing. We know all of our partners are on side, so... Uh, that's that's a, a great step forward that we heard about today. So, uh, without further ado, today uh, my I've been asked to talk about uh, uh, urban fishing in the city, and uh, we're going to do that. But also give a quick couple of slides on what the Ministry of Natural Resources is, in case some of you uh, were wondering. I've been asked to talk a little bit about fishing and to uh, sort of uh, connect fishing to uh, as a cultural community and then some of the uh, social and economic contributions that anglers make uh, to communities and to uh, uh, society in general. We'll talk briefly about that. And then we'll wrap it up with uh, just a quick listing of all the urban fishing festivals that we have here in the city. So what is the Ministry of Natural Resources? Well, we're Ontario's leading agency, government agency, uh, responsible for protecting and conserving our natural resources. And some of the things uh, that we manage are our forests, our wetlands, uh, gravel pits or uh, aggregates, uh, provincial parks, lakes, rivers and streams, wildlife, endangered species, and of course, fish. And you can see here is a slide uh, where we're doing some uh, tagging and some sampling of smallmouth bass. And uh, that's one of the many things that we do uh, with the Ministry of Natural Resources. I'm with the Aurora District. Uh, we have many districts right across the province encompassing large geographic areas. So our district basically covers all the way uh, from Clarington in the east to Burlington north, uh, the whole southeast side of Lake Simcoe and uh, everything in between. So we've got lots of area to cover, of course, including uh, Toronto, the city of Toronto, and uh, it's, it's a lot of work to manage that great of an area, but uh, with lots of partners, we seem to get it done. So uh, we do manage fish and wildlife populations. So I want to just, the word populations is underlined in that we, we don't manage individual fish or individual animals. We're not there to, uh, to send somebody to take care of an injured squirrel or anything like that. We manage populations and make sure that they're sustainable and uh, available for future generations. We have all kinds of research and uh, science that's always going on and locally the Lake Ontario Management Unit that uh, looks after the uh, monitoring and the research projects uh, for the fisheries of Lake Ontario. Uh, of course, and we manage everything from all kinds of critters and uh, we can't do that without partners, so we have many partners that uh, help us do our jobs. And as my career has progressed over many years, we rely more and more on partners in order to get our job done. 
one of those uh, programs that we work uh, with partners on a great deal, and one of the work jobs that I have at, our, at my district um, are to manage community fisheries wildlife involvement programs, projects that uh, enable partners to team with us to uh, do various enhancement work. And uh, if you don't mind, I just, we just happen to have in the crowd tonight one of the leading forefathers that brought CFWIP, Community Fisheries Wildlife Involvement Program, to Ontario, and that is uh, Mr. Alan Wainio, who is here. And if, Al, if you could just quickly stand up real quickly. Al is a former fisheries bio. For Southern Region, and I, I met Al way back when we were in Maple District. He's like been a mentor to many of us over the years. Uh, old school, good, hardcore biologist uh, that really made a lot of inroads into connecting uh, stakeholders to the resource and engaging them in the uh, fish and wildlife work that we do. So uh, it, it was really cool to see that he was here tonight. Uh, so. Part of the job we do as well is enforce uh, fishing and hunting regulations. You may have seen some of, some of our conservation officers along the waterfront. We do have several uh, that work for us out of the Aurora office. We have a, a, one or two that live right in the city and that do uh, uh, patrol various high uh, intensity areas. The, the cool thing is, speaking with our conservation areas, that there really aren't any major uh, enforcement issues here in the city pertaining to recreational anglers that they don't see anywhere else. So it's not like it's um, an area where there's a great deal more infractions or anything like that. For the most part, speaking with our COs, uh, they're, they're thrilled to see people enjoying the resource down here, enjoying the fishing opportunities, and almost always they have their license, they're keeping within the limits, and uh, what they love is that they're introducing the next generation of anglers, and a lot of times people are bringing their kids to go with them too. So that's a, a message that we had from our conservation officers. You know, many of us got into this position because of our love for fishing, and that's obviously how I got into it. It's great that I can sort of uh, meld the love that I have and the passion that I have for the sport of fishing with the job that I do. Uh, and promoting recreational fishing and fishing opportunities, uh, both in the greater Toronto area and broadly, and more, uh, more than just throughout our district, is, it comes very easy to me. I love to do it, and uh, I'm very fortunate that I'm able to do it uh, for my regular job. And we host uh, various fishing events. You can see here, this is one that we held up on uh, Georgina Island. That was the first fish this little girl ever caught, uh, a nice little bluegill, and she was absolutely thrilled, as was I, to have the privilege to uh, be in that picture with her. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is that um, license revenues, when you buy your fishing and hunting license, uh, those revenues go directly to the special purpose account that is uh, managed by the Ministry of Natural Resources. It's separate from the general coffers. So a lot of people don't realize that when they're buying that fishing license, that money goes to a special account where, uh, where that money is used to manage resources that we all enjoy. So I think that's really special because it's incredibly unique within how the government doles out its funds. Uh, not many ministries are fortunate enough to have this special purpose account, uh, but we are, and it augments uh, some of the other money we get to uh, manage the resources. So that's really important. Uh, I always like to say that working with anglers has, has really taught me that they have a direct connection to the resource. They're the ones who care to make sure that it's there for uh, future generations. They're stewards who like to protect it. And uh, they, they take a personal interest uh, to make sure that uh, they're making their contributions uh, to that lake or stream or forest or whatever the case may be. Okay. So what I love about fishing is that it means many different things to many different people, uh, whether it's shore fishing here along the waterfront in Toronto, whether it's ice fishing up on Lake Simcoe, the most intensively fished inland lake in the province only because of uh, the winter fishery, whether it's fishing in a tournament or just recreational fishing in a boat. The, the great thing is that all of those different segments of anglers, they're all passionate 
And uh, what I like to promote is that we all respect each other's ways that we like to fish. No one way is better than the other. A competitive angler isn't any better than one who doesn't like to fish competitively. It's just so many different things to so many different people. Uh, so this, I was first asked to do a fishing and culture talk a couple years ago for uh, the town of Georgina, and it, it really got me thinking that I didn't really think of fishing as a form of culture until I started looking into it a little bit more and, and began to realize that, yeah, you know, it really is a culture into and of itself. Uh, so if you define culture as a way of life for a group of people, then obviously anglers can fit into that, uh, into that mold. Uh, something that I wrote down here, therefore, people who love to fish can be recognized as a cultural community, one with a united, like-minded, and collective passion for the lake, its fish, and the sport of pursuing them, regardless of ethnicity, age, job, or financial status. And that's another great thing about fishing. It doesn't matter what your income is, or where you come from, where you live, uh, you can participate in fishing. You can start fishing when you're five years old or 95 years old. There aren't many uh, outdoor pursuits or activities, sports, where you can do that. And that's, that's one of the great things, I think, uh, about recreational fishing. Uh, a lot of people often say that cultures it's imperative for them to get together, to bind and unite. And there are many ways that anglers do that. Uh, you can do it in competitive fishing events. I love to fish tournaments, uh, but it's not the only way I fish. It's, uh, I fish many different ways, but love to fish competitively. Uh, there are family fishing festivals, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, those ones that we have here in the city. Uh, taking trips with family or friends. You know, it's interesting, I, I forget what study it was that I was reading uh, about in the U.S., but a lot of people, even if they don't fish a lot, they've interviewed people that are in their twilight years, and they ask them to try to remember the fondest memories that they've ever had in their lives. And they say it was amazing how many people reverted back to fishing trips that they had with key members of their family or friends, and they think about those times as the most memorable occasions that they've ever had in their lives. So that really struck a chord with me, and it just it, it made me realize and appreciate every fishing trip that I make uh, is creating a memory, uh, and hopefully that's, you know, I've passed that on to my kids, and uh, it, it helps to... Uh, to sometimes stop and smell the roses while you're actually uh, enjoying that fishing trip. Uh, so some of us are, are meeting by chance out on the water, and, and there seems to be that bond that, you know, you meet a bunch of people out there for the first time, but you're all speaking a common language, you all have the same interests, and it's easy to get along and easy to share a day in the boat. With, with a lot of these uh, tournaments that we fish, we're drawing partners that we've never met before, uh, total strangers, but within five minutes, it's like you're fishing with your best friend because you have that common bond, that common passion. And it's really cool to be able to do that uh, with someone that you hardly even know other than with your common thread and love for fishing. Uh, club meetings are a way that a lot of people meet these days. There are many different clubs around. I think I, I saw some club shirts here. Are there any anglers that belong to a fishing club in the, in the audience here tonight? A couple? All right, that's great. Um, and online fishing forums. I know they've really taken off the last few years. Uh, I'm just curious here how many people would say they log on to some of these angler forums on a fairly frequent basis. Yeah. So they've become a great way for anglers to unite as well, and I think, uh, you know, even with the issues the, f the fishing in the city here has had over the last uh, month or so, the anglers on these forums have really united in their passion to try to uh, move the yardstick and, and uh, enhance fishing opportunities. And of course, uh, through seminars and various presentations, uh, anglers unite as well and, and come together to learn and to, to network and to, to share like we are this evening. So fostering cultural awareness with uh, all kinds of groups is a big part of what, uh, what we do, talking with uh, uh, different clubs and various uh, groups of new Canadians to try to uh, 
get them excited about fishing and teach them about uh, our passion and some of the rules and regulations that we have. So now I'm moving quickly into the, the second part of my talk on uh, some of the contributions, uh, financial contributions that anglers make uh, to, uh, to communities in and around uh, Canada. So these are just some of the highlights. I'll quickly go through them. The la this National Recreational Survey is done by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, every four years, and it is something that, uh, that enables us to get some statistics on uh, angler participation levels and uh, funding, or sorry, uh, spending and not that kind of thing. So in 2010, there were over three and a half million adult licensed anglers uh, in Canada. So the, the uh, drawback, I think, to the National Recreational Fishing Survey is that, and some of these other surveys, is that we don't, they don't capture those uh, anglers that are over 65 that don't require a license or under 18 uh, that don't require a license either. So there is a gap there, admittedly. Almost one and a half million anglers uh, of that three and a half were from Ontario. So you can see that we're very well represented here in the province. Uh, almost, this is really cool, almost 200 million fish were caught in Canada. And uh, of those, about 62 million uh, were kept. So that means a lot of anglers practicing uh, catch and release and selective harvest out there. For Ontario, uh, there were 96 million fish caught. Uh, more than any other province. We have a quarter million lakes in this province, untold miles of rivers and streams, and arguably some of the finest fishing on the planet right here in the province of Ontario. Uh, and you can see there, of those 96 million, only uh, 20, just over 20 million were, were kept. Um, the average age of a Canadian angler admittedly is is getting up there a little bit at age 47. We'd love to see that figure come down as we have various promotions to try to get uh, more kids hooked on fishing and get that next generation of anglers uh, as keen as, uh, as we were when we were young uh, to get out there and enjoy uh, fishing. Each angler fishes an average, I love this statistic, an average of 13 times a year. If you look at other sports like golf and uh, uh, tennis or whatever, the average participation level is much below that. So anglers who love to fish do so fairly frequently a year at uh, 13 times. So that's not bad. Uh, how many in the, in the crowd here tonight would say they easily double that amount of, that they fish every year? All right, love to see it. So uh, some more expenditures uh, from, the, from that same 2010 survey. Uh, direct expenditures were uh, about $2.5 billion to the Canadian economy. Now we're going to break that down a little bit. In Ontario alone, it was over $900 uh, million. Major purchases, so things like boats, etc., that were used strictly for fishing, uh, accounted for almost $3 billion. In Ontario, that same figure uh, at $838 million. Major purchases, so like tow vehicles that you would buy, um, uh, or sorry, like boats, I'm sorry, that, that are completely attributable to uh, uh, fishing in Ontario, over $800 million. The purchases like tow vehicles that you would use to uh, tow your boat, but then you also use your vehicle for other things. Uh, that was all factored in as well. So that was over $5 billion. And in Ontario, that figure was about $1.5 billion. So anglers are contributing uh, a great deal economically to, uh, to economies around the country. I love these stats. Okay, this was something that was worked up by the Canadian National Sport Fishing Industry Association with the last set of guide of, of recreational fishing survey data from 2000. So it hasn't been done yet for the 2010 survey, uh, but I know the uh, industry is anxious to make these comparisons again because they really drive home uh, some of the uh, uh, everyday comparisons that we can relate to. And, and in a bar setting like this, I think this first one is, is pretty cool that we spend as much on beer as we do on fishing uh, around the country. How Canadian is that? Uh, the voting strength of anglers across, uh, across the country is one and a half times the voting strength of those over 65. So that, that's kind of cool. 
Uh, Canadians, again, licensed over, or those over 15 who fish, outnumber those who play golf and hockey combined. Our national pastime, and more people fish than play our national pastime, and you can even add golf on top of that. So that, that, that's pretty cool that uh, so many of us are out there fishing. And uh, the, the uh, artsy kind of... Uh, Slide in here for uh, movie theater goers. Uh, we anglers spend 10 times more uh, than all movie theaters bring in every year. So that, that's kind of cool as well. This one I'm just going to go through too long because I don't like to focus on negative uh, too much. But that same National Recreational Fishing Survey does identify that overall numbers of anglers in Canada are decreasing. Uh, so there's a concern that we uh, are losing touch with uh, the resource and with this great outdoor activity and some of the reasons that anglers uh, are giving and those that answered the survey uh, were that they didn't have enough time, uh, that equipment and licenses was, were too expensive, they now had other interests. Uh, some had said that there was poor fishing quality or the weather, that's always an excuse, eh? Um, some thought there was uh, regulations that were too complicated uh, that no one to fish with, and I think that was more for uh, some of the older anglers that uh, just uh, lost their fishing buddies or lost touch with those that they used to fish with. Uh, some had physical problems. Uh, many of them said it was uh, too far to get to good fishing areas. The lack of proper access is always a key um, deterrent for fishing. When I look at these kind of surveys from uh, from province to province and from one country to the next. In the United States, it's a huge issue. In Canada, it's a huge issue. The greatest deterrent to increasing uh, angler participation uh, is access to water. Access is key uh, in order to have public access, in order to have good boat launches, in order to have parking close to the good boat launches, or able to um, access a shoreline and uh, leave your vehicle or if here in the city you're fortunate you can often take public transit but to be able to simply access that water body it sounds so simple but uh, without that public access it's pretty difficult to go fishing uh, in public water bodies so um, not accounted for again uh, where the dwindling number of youth and we already spoke about that so we're going to talk now about the uh, urban fishing festivals and some of the license-free fishing uh, events that we have here in Toronto. Basically, around the province, uh, there, we have the uh, Family Fishing Day long weekend in uh, the winter when no licenses are required. Uh, that's uh, just during that family day weekend. It's, it's to promote ice fishing primarily. And then again, we have one in July. And this year, that license-free period, uh, as uh, has already been mentioned here, is from July 7th to the 15th in the summer. And uh, that is for the first time we're going to have two weekends available for uh, anglers or, or would-be anglers to uh, try this sport. Uh, so that makes it really convenient for a lot of people. The only One of the major restrictions is that we have conservation limits so there are sport licenses that you can purchase and conservation licenses basically the conservation licenses reduce your uh, daily catch so you basically need to check the regulations for the different species and those numbers will be reduced uh, if you're under that uh, fishing during those time frames to equal those of the conservation license uh, National Fishing Week is a program uh, that is uh, a great program run right around the country. It used to be separate entity from the Provincial uh, Family Fishing Weekend that we have, but the two have combined forces so that it's running at the same time. Uh, and of course, uh, it, it's amazing how many people don't realize that kids under 18 not only are licensed, do not require a license at any time, but they can fish on their own. Uh, so a lot of parents call me and say, and their assumption is that their, their kids go under their license and they need to buy a license. That's not the case if you're an Ontario resident. Those children um, have all the uh, rights and responsibilities of a fully licensed angler. So a 15-year-old kid that, whose parents feel that it's safe for him to fish along the waterfront can do so uh, and have the full license uh, or the sport license 
uh, abilities to take home those limits, but he's also responsible to make sure that you can't fish for bass before the fourth Saturday in June and that you can't use two rods and that uh, you can't snag fish and you have to be able to identify your fish in order to know what you're taking home. So they also need those uh, uh, responsibilities that go along with a fully licensed angler. So here are some of the events that we have. We uh, coordinate actually eight of them uh, around the greater Toronto area. We've uh, increased uh, from one over for last year, and this is the 27th year. And I've been involved with this program for well over half of those uh, promoting these urban fishing festivals in the greater Toronto area. Uh, the first one that we'll briefly talk about, we're just talking around the Lake Ontario uh, shoreline, would be the one out in Pickering at Frenchman's Bay, and uh, we saw the presentation there showing the walleye. Not too many walleye are caught from the shore uh, during that weekend, but all kinds of other fish are caught. Uh, there's bass, and there's sunfish, and there's rock bass, brown bullhead. Amazingly, a lot of round gobies are caught, an invasive species. So we combine a lot of our um, education and awareness programming to some of these events as well, where we're showing people um, how to identify a uh, invasive species like the round goby, and of course, teaching them not to put it in the lake or not to release it, that kind of thing. Uh, so that event's happening on July 7th. We have one right here in the heart of Toronto, High Park, uh, Grenadier Pond, again, we've been promoting various fishing opportunities at Grenadier for many years, and about four or five years ago, Grenadier came on board. Um, in no small part, I think, to uh, one of the key players that we have here in the city of Toronto, uh, Mr. Al Crawford. Al, I'd just like to stand up one quick second. He's been instrumental in uh, having the voice of anglers here in uh, the city of Toronto. An email at 7:37 from the supervisor of Hyde Park, asking me to meet with her at 9 o'clock tomorrow to discuss family fishing day. This is the work of Will Wagman and Dave Chong and Debbie Pelican, who's here from the Aurora office. Without you guys, this would never have happened. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Al. We know it can't happen without you either. Okay, so that event is on uh, Saturday, July 7th. We work with all kinds of partners to make these happen. The best thing about these events are that they're completely free. How many events can you take your family to where they're going to uh, let you use the equipment, free rods and reels available in many of them? Uh, there's hot dogs for the kids, drinks, refreshments. There's free bait. Uh, all Everything that you need in order to enjoy a great day of fishing with your kids. One of the Finest events that we have is at Toronto Islands. Uh, we have a conservation officer here who's been to many of the events, uh, and he's, uh, he's here in the crowd as well. Alex Smith, if you just want to wave your hand real quickly here to everyone. He's uh, often at these events helping kids and getting them hooked on fishing. So... Uh, some more, for more fishing information, you can just quickly have a look at these uh, sites. Of course, there's our, our own natural resources site with all kinds of links. We have a great fish online tool. If you're ever curious about a lake um, and what kind of fish are there, go on, link on to the fish online uh, portion of our site and you can find out about uh, that water body. The more popular water bodies, anyways, uh, not all quarter million of them are there, but uh, well over uh, a thousand of them are listed on that site, and it's, uh, it's a great tool. The Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, of course, lots of fishing information. The complete list of events uh, around the province are listed on uh, the familyfishingweekend.com site, and uh, lots of information at uh, just the OFAH site as well. Toronto Region Conservation Authority, they have several conservation areas where you can go fishing and you can log on there and find out more about those. National Fishing Week, they also have a great little booklet produced by the late great Rick Amsbury, a uh, strong proponent of youth fishing and uh, fishing in general, produced this great booklet for kids that uh, you can download free on that site. So, closing thought here, um, anglers, we all need to be ambassadors for this sport that we love and we're the uh, stewards of the resource. People who actively fish have a direct connection to the water bodies they visit. They become stewards of the resource and feel a responsibility to conserve it for future generations. So that's it. We're not, I'm not going to take questions right now. We'll wait till the end and have a panel, but I, it's usually my closing slide. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll uh, stick around for you later.